And one time we had a birthday party in the backyard and we were looking for the birthday girl and she was under the car. Me? Yes. Oh, I don't even remember this. I was no. hiding under a car. Don't you remember that? She's talking to my aunt who was across the room. Did I really hide under a car? You crawled under the car. They had the bing, the little jump house there, and we played games, and we had hot dogs and potato chips and ice cream and cake. How old was I turning? You were turning what? Three? No, maybe four or five. Oh, my gosh. Mm. And they said, well, where is Nicole? And then all at once we heard this crying, and you had crawled under a car that was packed, parked in the driveway. Oh, uh, in the back. boy. Started at a young age, friends. Right. Yes. <laughs> Hi. So I am Nick Stone, the person in that video. And this, before I begin, I'm going to introduce my lovely ASL interpreter, Brian. He will be helping me here to make sure everybody gets to partake in my foolishness, honestly. Um, so Hopefully all of you already know that you are at the Everywhere Book Fest because this is the second day and I apparently am the last thing you're gonna see. Uh, apologies in advance. But I am here to talk about story and the power of story and the purpose of story and why stories are important. Um, so obviously I am a storyteller. I am currently in my Sometimes storytelling space. Um, this is my home office that I have not actually been using lately because my children are here. We are in a global pandemic. They cannot go to school, which means there's not, it's not quiet enough anywhere in my house uh, for me to get anything done. There's a chance they will probably come in at some point. And I told them that was okay because they're a part of story too. Um, once we get to the end of this, you will come to discover that the whole point of what I am telling you right now is to emphasize the fact that we are all living a story. And that is why story is so important. So that was my spoiler alert. These are some of my stories. Um, each one has a different bent. Each one has different characters. Some characters appear in more than one of these books, et cetera, et cetera. But at the heart of each one of them is a narrative. Um, I want today to break down the concept of story and talk about why I think each element that I'm going to give you using story as an acronym, because Nick Stone loves acronyms, um, I'm going to tell you why I think each element is important and how these elements kind of connect us all. So the word story is spelled S-T-O-R-Y. Great word, great letters. Um, We'll start with the letter S. In order to write, tell, create anything, a story, you have to have a setting. Um, and of course, setting is where your story takes place. Uh, right now, if we were telling the story of the Everywhere Book Festival, the setting would be everywhere. If we were telling an individualized tale about the Everywhere Book Festival, where is Nick Stone? What is Nick Stone's story during Everywhere Book Festival? She would be in her home office at her house in Atlanta, Georgia staying inside, despite the fact that our governor has decided we can go out. We're not doing that down here. Um, but setting is one of the most important things about stories, because if you don't know where a story takes place, it's impossible to know like a pretty significant chunk of it. You know, like if you don't know the where, the how, the why, the who, all of those things fall apart because the where affects everything else. Of my stories, most of them are set in the city of Atlanta, um, largely because it's where I'm, I was born, it's where I was raised, it's the city that I'm most familiar with. I can be a little lazy when it comes to like trying to figure out like, I'm not gonna set a story in Spokane, Washington because that involves me going Spokane, Washington and learning Spokane, Washington. But because I have so much experience with Atlanta, I'm able to take elements of the city and my experiences in the city and create something authentic when it comes to setting. Um, I'm also writing a story set in the fictional nation of Wakanda, uh, which is way cooler than Atlanta, I will say. Um, but this is the thing, no matter how familiar I am with the city of Atlanta, 
the city of Atlanta is ever evolving, which is part of the reason setting gives us a bit of insight into the human experience, right? So the Atlanta that I am experiencing now at age almost 35 in the year 2020 is vastly different than the Atlanta of 1861, 1862, 1863, the years of the Civil War. Um, Atlanta was a hotbed of Civil War activity and you can drive around the city, you can see all of these monuments and there are plaques and things that tell you about these different battles that took place in this city. But I say all that to say, what, me writing the story in the city of Atlanta now is a very different thing than me writing it like if I was writing a story set in like the 1860s, because like time, like time frame, not time frame, but like the timing of the story, the year that the story is set is also a part of your setting. Um, so when you think of where you are and how where you are affects who you are, what you think, what you believe, how you feel, what's the weather like, how like today, it's like 78 beautiful, glorious degrees outside. The skies are clear. And that would affect the story I was telling today. If it were rainy here, it would affect the story I was telling today. And I think that it's important that we all consider where we are at all times, not just in storytelling, but like even right now. So I'm at home. I've been at home for eight weeks. I have not been at home for this length of time since the year 2017. And being here in this particular setting and kind of living out this current story is giving me a lot of insight. So when you guys are thinking of story, when you're thinking of setting, whether you're a writer or a reader, think about how that setting is affecting the characters. And as you think about how it's affecting the characters, think about how it would affect you. Next letter is T, which is time. And this time, I mean time, the length of time the story is taking place. Um, there are stories that take place over the course of 200 years. There are stories that take place over the course of 60 seconds. Uh, Long Way Down by Jason Reynolds is one of my favorites that takes place in a really, really small window of time. But the thing about time is that it sets so much of your story, right? It determines the pacing. So if you have Jason Reynolds' Long Way Down book that takes place in 60 seconds is the same length page-wise as my Dear Martin book that takes place over the course of the year. So you have the same number of pages. There's not the same number of words, but with the same number of pages, you're telling a completely different story. There's a completely different amount of time that the story is taking place, which means there's more stuff that I'm including in my story. Um, the page turns, There, there's also a lot of stuff I'm not including, right? Like Jason can detail every every single thing that happens in this 60 second story with flashbacks. But I'm like, okay, I have to jump from Monday to next Tuesday, right? So there's like chunks of time that are missing. While this is true in books, what I want you all to consider is how much time you have now and what you're getting to do with it. When we look back and we tell the story of this pandemic, there will be a length of time that it lasted, right? Like I said, right now, I'm at the eight week mark. Who knows how much longer it's gonna stretch, but so much is happening and so much is changing and I'm learning so much and I'm getting to spend all this time with my family during this stretch. And I want us all to think about when you're reading, think about how much time is elapsing over the course of the story. Think about how that affects the story. And again, think about how it would affect you. Um, I'm going to give you some homework because time is a thing in story that I find absolutely fascinating. And when I think about, for instance, the Harry Potter books, each one of them takes place basically over the course of a year. Um, there's like a school year. It's like a school year kind of time frame. And I think when I look back at those stories, there's one in particular uh, I think it's in Chamber of Secrets where J.K. Rowling just completely skips the entire winter holidays. Like one minute they're in school and the next, and then the holidays were over and they move on into the next thing that's happening, which is interesting, right? Because I remember sitting there reading that one day and thinking about like what was happening during that time. Clearly nothing significant enough to be included in the story, but there had to be things going on, right? Like 
did moaning Myrtle clog a new toilet? Like what, like it might not have been significant to that particular plot, but, but every moment in our actual lives, I think is significant. So as you read, as you write, as you live, enjoy like time. Like I'm real big on like mindfulness. Think about the things going on around you at all times and like try to sink into it, if you will. Uh, the letter O is what I call the oh boy moment. And that is the moment when the story kicks off. In writing school, we call this the inciting incident. It's when little Johnny finds his grandfather's journal from 1963 and learns of a mystery. It's when Harry Potter finally gets to open one of these letters that's been flying into his aunt and uncle's house and realizes that like there's this place that has invited him to come and study and live there. It's the moment when everything changes, right? It splits your story into a before and an after. All of us are living after a really huge oh boy moment. Um, some of you will be able to pinpoint it. I remember, this is, I'm like going to a different example here, but I remember uh, September 11th, 2001. I was coming into my US history class when I walked in the door, I saw my teacher, his name was Mr. Trapathi, and he was standing, staring up at the television because we had those big box TVs and they were tucked up into the corner of the wall in the classroom. And he's just staring at the TV. And on the TV, there's this replay of these two of these planes flying into these buildings and these buildings crumbling. And it was replaying and replaying and replaying. That was an oh boy moment. It was a moment that I will never forget. There are going to be so many moments in our lives right now that I hope we don't forget. I was talking yesterday to, um, I was talking to a friend of mine about how we are in this very interesting time that has split our lives into, very much split our lives into a before and an after. And I have seen some really amazing acts of compassion going on. Um, I've seen people kind of step up to help other people. I've seen people lend their talents and their gifts to raising money to help people who don't have any. And I am just hoping that after, as we progress into like getting, going to a different type of normal because there's no going back, right? Like I don't think there's any going back to what was before, but as we progress into something new, I'm hoping that things stick. And if you think about it, this is how story works. If you're reading a book, you typically have a character who, something happens, there's an inciting incident and the character is kind of thrust into a journey. If at the end of the book, the character is just going back to where they started, like how great, of that, like probably just wasn't really that great of a story. Um, I think of this oh boy moment as the crystallizer of the end of what was and the beginning of what is coming and what will be. So take that little piece of information and think about how you can take this oh boy moment of this pandemic that we're in and make sure that when you continue on into the next chapter of your own personal story, you have grown as a character, as a person. Um, the next letter is R, risk. Risk is stakes, right? Like I just say risk because it fits in the word story. I, a trick of acronyming. Um, risk are the stakes of a story. The the thing that the person the story is about is fighting for. What do we stand to gain or to lose by accomplishing the mission of the story? There is no good story without some kind of stakes. If you think about um, your own favorite story, I'm pretty sure you could kind of sift the stakes out of it. Going back to Harry Potter, because obvious, I'm obviously like a giant Harry Potter fanatic. You can see my like Harry Potter pillow and the Expecto Patronum pillow. I, this wasn't even on purpose. I promise I didn't do this on purpose. The golden snitch beanbag chair. The snakes in the snakes, the snakes. There are snakes in Harry Potter. However, the stakes in Harry Potter, um, they are different, of course, for each book. But the overall stakes of the series are like, it's like the fate of the world, right? What are the stakes of 
the story we're living together. I, I, this is the thing I've been thinking about a lot. What happens if once this pandemic is over, we all just kind of try to go back to what was before and these new instances of compassion and people working together and collaborating and connecting on levels that we weren't really connecting before, what would happen if all of that just went away and we decided that we weren't gonna do those things anymore? Um, even the stakes within the pandemic, right? I haven't really left, like I, I leave my house, I go to therapy every Tuesday because therapy is essential for me. Um, I go to the grocery store, like occasionally my whole family will go to the grocery store. My partner will go in and do the shopping and me and the two children will stay in the car because the stakes of going into a grocery store are pretty high right now. Um, so as we think about risk, as we think about stakes, as we think about what we stand to gain and lose, not only in the stories we're reading, like we think about what the characters are gaining to losing in the stories that they're in, but we should also use that as a lens to think about what we stand to gain and lose in the story of like humanity and this story that we're living in now. Um, because honestly, I've gained a lot during this pandemic. Um, perspective is a thing that I've gained. Time with my family is a thing that I've gained. Um, deeper connection with friends, reconnection with friends that I haven't talked to in a long time is a thing that I've gained. And I know that I risk losing those things if I don't kind of make sure that I am transforming in the midst of this story that I'm living in. And then the last element of story, the letter Y is for you, me, a character. A story has to be about some kind of sentient being, a thinking, feeling person. Uh, what's interesting though is like even stories that aren't about people are about people. Um, there's a book called The Little Blue Truck, one of my littlest kids' favorites. The little blue truck went down the road, beep said blue to the little green toad. It's about this truck who drives around a farm one morning and says hello to all of the animals that he passes. Um, it is this just act of kindness. He goes around, he says hi to a duck, he says hi to a toad, he says hi to all of the farm animals, and there's a dump truck. And the dump truck doesn't say hi to anybody. The dump truck is a little self-important. The, the dump truck has important things to do, the book says. Well, then the dump truck gets stuck in the mud and can't get out. And the dump truck finds himself suddenly in need of some assistance. But he hasn't spoken to any of the animals. So who's gonna help him, right? Of course, the little blue truck comes through, saves the day, gathers all of the friends that he has made by being a person who says hello, well, being a truck who says hello, and they wind up helping this dump truck out of the mud. But the most interesting thing to me about this story is that when I'm reading it to my kids, while he's hearing a story about a truck, the you, of course, in this story is a truck, he's actually hearing a story about humanity. He's hearing a story about the power of kindness. He's hearing a story about what happens when kindness comes back to you. He's hearing a story about what happens when kindness comes back to you and you use it to help somebody who was unkind. And I think that particular book has highlighted to me the fact that stories are very human in nature. Every story is about people in some way, shape, or form, which is why the character of the story, the person going on the journey, is to me the most important element. Um, another reason that I think character is the most important element is because like, when I am interacting with a new book, interacting with a new story that I'm writing or one that I'm reading, I have this opportunity to enter into a headspace that I've never been in before. And I think that that's what helps us become better people, right? Like books and stories are these tools of empathy that there's nothing like them. Um, I remember when Dear Martin, Dear Martin was my first published novel. It came out in 2017. 
And I remember having a conversation with a reader who was nervous about reading Dear Martin. Um, she was an older white lady and she was nervous that sh the book was going to be angry, right? Like that she was gonna read this book and this is gonna be an angry book. And I had to stop her and I had to remind her that it's an inanimate object. Like that's the beauty of books to me. They can have expressions of anger. They can have expressions of despair. They can have really powerful emotions embedded in them but a book can't hit you a book can't bite you a book can't like yes it can wreck you emotionally but it doesn't have the power to bring you to do you any kind of physical harm which is why i love books as these tools for helping us connect to other people so story s setting t time frame uh o oh boy moment r risk or stakes, and the why is you. These are the most important elements of story. Now, why do stories matter? So in the opening here, um, we watched a like 50 second clip of me talking to my grandmother. Uh, my grandmother's name is Glenda. She is 85. She will be 86 years old this year. She was born in 1934. And when I was young, one of my favorite things to do was to just listen to my grandmother talk. Uh, she was, she is, and has always been a very active and like lively person. She taught us to do paper mache. We used to play baseball in her backyard. Um, she was that grandmother who would tackle you if you stood in the way of the base. Now my grandmother is four foot, she's like four foot nine. Like she's not a tall person. She's never been a tall person. She's tiny, but she's always had this fire inside of her. So one of my favorite things to do has always been to just listen to her stories. And it's through stories from my grandmother that I've learned a lot about myself. So like I said, my grandmother was born in 1934. And there was one day when she was telling me about being young and coming to learn that her maternal, I think it's her maternal grandmother was the slave master's daughter. Um, her grandfather, so her mother's father was an Irishman, but her mother's mother, that was her mother's mother's mother was the daughter of the slave master. And hearing my grandmother confirm like my slave ancestry, confirm my slave ancestry, excuse me, um, was powerful in and of itself. But hearing her talk about learning that as a kid and learning how um, that impacted her and how like it gave her this resilience it gave me some insight into the person that she was, which then gave me some insight into the person that I am because the person that she is because of what she learned from her great grandmother, from her grandmother and from her mother has shaped who she became, which then has shaped who I am becoming. Um, this is why I think stories are so important, right? Especially when it comes to stories in our families, we're spending a lot of time, a lot of us are spending a lot of time with family these days, uh, sheltering in place. And I want to encourage everyone from age five, like if you can talk basically and have the power of comprehension and communication, um, from five to 85, to interact and tell each other the stories of your own lives. Um, grandparents, tell your, your grandchildren your stories. Parents, tell your children their stories. Listen to your children's stories. One of the best stories I heard last week was my seven-year-old son telling me about the first time he met his uh, girlfriend. He apparently has a girlfriend um, in his class. Actually, she's not in his class. She's in a different class. So he was telling me the story because he was telling me that he hopes that this young lady is in his class next year. But he told me this story about how they met one day at school and they met at recess and he just thought she was so beautiful. And then they became best friends and now they're gonna get married one day. Listening to my son tell me that story tells me a lot about my son. It helps me to connect with him in a way that, you know, 
I don't know that other mediums could. Like, yes, we can sit and watch a movie together, but that's not the same as hearing this kid tell a story and hearing what makes him smile, hearing how he got a hug from this little girl one day and it made his entire day. I'm able to connect with him on that because I'm also a person who loves hugs. Man, we'll see how I do after the pandemic is over without hugs. It's gonna be, it's really gonna be something. Um, but stories have the power to connect us and they have the power to give, like they have, they have the power to give us insight into ourselves and they have the power to connect us. They also have the power to teach us about other people, which I think might be the most important element of story, not element, but like the most important things that stories can do. Um, I became a storyteller after meeting a young lady in Bethlehem, right? So I spent the summer of 2008 in Israel and I went to visit the city of Bethlehem, which is technically in the West Bank. I will not give a history of that region of the world, but suffice it to say, it's in contested territory. And it's an area where the people who live there and who have been there for generations, um, they have to have a permit to be able to go in, to go to the other side of the wall. So anyway, I'm going into Bethlehem thinking I'm gonna like go and see all of this really cool archeology span and like go to the church where Jesus was supposedly born, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I wound up meeting this family. I got to stay with them at their home in Bethlehem. And there was a daughter who was, she was like a year or two younger than me at the time. And her sole ambition at that point, she just really wanted to go to university in the UK. And I was like, well, why don't you just do it? It turns out she had no country of citizenship, right? So she is a person living in a part of a country that isn't technically considered a part of the country. It's a very complex uh, situation, I'll put it like that. But long story short, there was no embassy where she could go get a passport. There was no governing body that could give her an, a device or a, an object that would allow her to travel internationally. So she couldn't, she couldn't leave because she couldn't get a passport. And it was hearing her story and recognizing some just like basic human emotion in it, like the desire to, to chase a dream. You know, I think most of us can identify with that. We can, most of us can identify with the desire to, to do something. You, there's something that you wanna do. I think most of us can identify with the frustration of not being able to do it for reasons outside of your control. And it was listening to her story that made me want to tell stories because I'd never heard a story like hers before. Um, so I'm going to take questions in about a minute and a half. And I want to close off my like talking at you, just wrapping up what I just rambled on about for 30 minutes. Um, <laughs> We did the story acronym and then stories, why I think they're important. They have the power to teach us about ourselves. They have the power to connect us and they have the power to teach us about other people. Because at the end of the day, we are all human. And no matter where we're from, no matter where we're going, where we've been, like most humans have the same basic set of emotional responses. So. I can connect with anybody on just about anything as long as I'm, as long as I'm able to tap into emotion. Um, and we should use that. We should use that, fe those feelings of emotion um, to connect with other people, especially through story. So let's take some questions. Dun, 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 dun. How does your story acronym fit in with Clean Getaway? That is a superb question. So this is Clean Getaway. Clean Getaway follows an 11-year-old black boy named William, uh, who is 
more commonly known by his nickname of Scoob. Um, he goes on a road trip across the American South with his white grandmother. And as they travel on this trip, he's learning things about her. He's learning things about the past. And he's learning that neither are what they seem. Um, so the story acronym as applied to, to clean getaway. Setting for this book, uh, most of the book actually takes place on an RV. It is a Winnebago that his grandmother sells her house to purchase. It is a similar Winnebago to the one that she drove um, across a few states on an attempt at this same trip with her African-American husband in the 1960s. Um, so inside the Winnebago, which is where most of the story takes place, there's a lot of like stuff in there and all of that stuff is kind of vital to the story. But another thing about setting in this book is that they go across, um, they leave Georgia, they go across Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, and Texas. And there is even a scene that takes place in Mexico. So the setting for this book goes across all of those states and into Mexico, but like I said, is mostly on an RV. The time frame of the story, it takes place over about the court, over about, let's see, the trip itself is like five or six, five days or so. Um, the entire book takes place over the course of 22 days. And yeah, that 22 days. The oh boy moment is, I mean, it really opens with an oh boy moment because it opens with this kid in this Winnebago after having kind of left his home while he's on lockdown. So he's gotten in trouble at school. And the oh boy moment here is kind of realizing that he's in this Winnebago with his grandmother and that things have changed in his life. Um, the R uh, for risk, I can't say too much about because I don't want to spoil it. But what I will say is that as they go on this trip, this young man is learning some things about his grandmother that he did not know. And the stakes rise the more he learns. And then the U, the character is um, Scoob. Like I said, he's 11. He's a little black boy. And he is... Uh, yeah, he's going through it, man, in this book. I want to actually also talk about the little green book in his hand. So the green book here was a really vital piece of this particular story. Um, so the Negro Traveler's Green Book is a little green book. I have multiple copies that have somehow been swallowed and are in the bowels of my messy house right now. Um, but it was a thing used by African-American travelers um, who were going on road trips because during the time that his grandmother attempted to take this trip with her husband in 1968, it wasn't safe for black people and white people to travel together. It actually wasn't even safe for black people to really travel alone. Um, so that gives some insight into like what I was saying about how as story changes over time, I mean, as setting changes over time, it affects the story, it affects the characters, and it affects basically all of the other elements. Next question. Do you think your different main characters would be friends? Why or why not? Um, probably. I think that there are the main, main characters, yeah, I think they would pretty much, they'd be cool. Some of them would like really lock, they'd like really lock in together. I think that Jupiter from Odd One Out and uh, Rico from Jackpot would be really, really great friends. Like they would develop a really solid friendship. I think that Justice from Dear Martin would be really great friends with Ray from Odd One Out. I think Shuri would be friends with everybody, but also would probably get on everybody's nerves because she's so much smarter than everybody. Um, but I do think she and Scoob would make excellent friends. This is actually a really good question because I'm gonna, and now I'm gonna be thinking about it for the rest of the day because I think I'd probably write characters who would absolutely all get along. Um, main characters at least. Some side characters, no, but the main characters probably would all get along, which means I might need to shake things up a bit. Thanks for that question. I'm going to be uh, chewing on that one. 
Ooh, I love this question. Thank you, Erin. How does your mindfulness practice impact your writing? So I cannot actually sit down to write without going through a mindfulness exercise first. So like mindfulness, for those of you who don't know what mindfulness is, it's basically the practice of being where you are when you're there. Um, I think that in our very fast paced society, it's like fast paced and like heavily technological. We have conditioned ourselves to constantly be thinking about the next thing. Um, what do I have to, like, I'm, I'm here right now doing this keynote, but like, what do I have to do next? Where do I have to go? I need to, I want to go get some donuts. Like there are 10,000 things running through my head as I'm doing one specific thing, um, which does not bode well for writing because writing for me is such like, it's a thing where I really have to be able to focus. Um, there's this thing we're about to get kind of woo woo here, but, um, there's this thing called flow in writing where you're able to enter into the story and then you just go and you look up and it's been like three hours and you've written 3000 words and you, you feel like a boss and it's awesome. It's really hard to get into that space with distractions um, and the distractions are everywhere. So for me, in order to write, I now I leave my cell phone inside my house. I turn the Wi-Fi off on my laptop before I go out my back door and I go and I climb into my tent and I write, I put my Microsoft Word in focus mode. I sit down in my golden snitch, the other golden snitch bean bag chair, and I feel the chair beneath me. I feel, um, I like like looking at the top of the tent and looking in, looking at the color, looking at the way the shadow from the tree kind of plays at the top of the tent. I love just listening to the wind whistling outside. There's like a little window with a mesh screen. I like listening to the wind outside of the tent window, looking and seeing the trees, the leaves on the trees blowing in the wind. Those kinds of things help me to center myself in my space so that I can actually enter into a story. Juniper, age six, you're my hero, first of all. I just want to say that. Um, you are learning how to read. Do I have a book to recommend without ghosts? I absolutely do, my dear. Is it in this room? I do have one in this room. Give me like two seconds. I'll keep talking. I'm just going to disappear from the screen. So this is a book that I actually had the opportunity to read on Instagram Live a few days ago. It's one of our favorites here in my house. And it's actually a book that I think leans a little bit into mindfulness and teaches us some things about where we live. It's called Here We Are. The author's name is Oliver Jeffers. And you can see here that the tagline, as we call this little thing right here, um, is Notes for Living on Planet Earth. And I think part of the reason I really love this book, Juniper, is because not only do you get some science in here, like check this out. This is a book about land. I mean, this is a page about land. You see these different types of land. There's a page. The next one is about the sea. So you're learning things about our earth, but you're also learning about how to interact with it. So this is the book, Juniper, that I recommend for you. Um, if you have your mommy email me, your mommy, your daddy, granny, whoever you're with, if you have them email me, um, go on my website. I will send you a copy because I literally have probably 15 in my house. We gave this out as a party favor at my son's seventh birthday. So shoot me an email with your address, Jennifer, and I will make sure you get a copy of this book. Would you say you're similar to any of your protagonists? If so, which one are you most like? There is a little bit of me in every one of my protagonists. The one that I am most like in demeanor, expression, attitude is Jupiter from Odd One Out. The one that I am most like in experience, like life experience is Rico from um, Jackpot. They are both, very interesting characters. Um, and I had a lot of fun writing them. Um, but yeah, it's also kind of terrifying. Any of you who want to write, especially you young people, 
recognize that at some point you're going to feel really exposed. Um, I am listening right now to Neil Gaiman's uh, masterclass. So there's this thing called masterclass where you can like sign up and then all of these people who are really good at the things that they do will teach you. They will teach you a class on how to do the thing that they do the way that they do it. So Neil Gaiman has this masterclass where he talks about the need for truth in storytelling. And I find that as I write my books, I feel very exposed when my own life and my own experiences and my own feelings about the world kind of leach into the story because a lot of it just feels very like sacred and private. But, but because I allow it to kind of leach out and I allow myself to appear in these characters and I put in the things about myself that I maybe don't want people to know necessarily, like because I put all that into the characters, the characters come across as very authentic, which makes it easier for people to connect with them. And then I wind up kind of validating myself. It's pretty awesome. What are some of your future story ideas and which are you most excited about telling? Ooh, this is good. Um, okay, so I don't usually do this because I'm like kind of superstitious, but I'm going to I'm going to do this here and now because I think it'll also make me be accountable. I have had this one story idea that I've wanted to explore for a little over a year now. And it has a lot to do with the reason I wrote Clean Getaway. So as I mentioned, Clean Getaway is about a little black boy on a road trip with his white grandmother. So I got the idea for a black boy, a black boy with a white grandmother from my own children. Uh, my, gra my grandmother, my mother-in-law, my children's grandmother is Russian. Um, she is a Russian Jewish woman. She is absolutely delightful. I adore her. But I have these little brown boys who have these little black boys who have this Russian Jewish grandmother. And um, my children went to Jewish preschool. They will bar mitzvah, et cetera. But the whole them as people uh, sparked this idea for a kind of a middle grade adventure fantasy series where this pair of black brothers, uh, they're four years apart, just like my kids, huh? um, find a set of Russian nesting dolls in the attic and the little one opens them up and gets sucked into this like fantasy Russia. So these are two black kids that get pulled from their, you know, metropolitan city home in Atlanta, because of course there, it's going to be in Atlanta. I'm, it's gonna be, it's set in Atlanta. And they get pulled into this whole other world where there are things like snow. They've never seen snow before. Um, and they have to contend with all of this stuff from a completely different culture, but a culture that's a part of them. So it's this process of them like learning about themselves as they go through this world that is completely unlike anything they've experienced. So you heard it here first. I've been thinking about doing it. And now maybe because I told all of you that I wanna do this, Russian nesting doll folklore with little black boy story. Maybe I'll start doing it. I totally did start doing it already. Anyway, what's the next question? No, no. The question is, will I please run for office? I absolutely will not, Karen Klein. That is a uh, no. I'm not running anybody's country. I can barely run my house. So let's save everyone by making sure Nick Stone never runs for any type of office. I, I think I would probably destroy some things. But thank you for that lovely compliment. Um, I am glad that you see me with leadership potential, I guess. Yeah, yeah. I got time for one last question. Ooh, can I please make Shuri a series? Uh, yeah. I'll tell you a secret. If you go um, onto Target's website and you type in Shuri, Nick Stone, you will make an interesting discovery. I think it's still there. It should still be there. But that's all I'm going to say because there are things that haven't been announced. <laughs> hit, hit. I'm excited about these things too. So anyway, that's all I got, friends. Hopefully this was like vaguely entertaining, if nothing else. I will say like as my last thing before I go, 
talking into a computer screen and having no idea of feedback is really weird. Um, so yes, like I said, I hope you all enjoyed Everywhere Book Fest. Shout out to the organizers, like y'all did this. I am so thrilled to have been a part of it. Um, and I hope, like I said, I hope you all got something, got a lot of things out of even just being together doing this thing. Um, live on, story hard, and have a wonderful weekend, friends. I love you all.